Everybody coming in here upset they didn't get a, a Steam Deck? They didn't win the Steam Deck? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll try to make you a bit happier by talking about local development environments. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how we go, hey? <laughs> so I'm here to talk about patterns for local development in, uh, environment nirvana. So, and for those who don't know me, my name's Nick Shu. I work at Previous Next. I'm the operations lead there. I've been at Previous Next for over a decade and just sort of reinvented my role over that time, going from a developer role all the way into ops. So everything from local development environment to CI to, to our hosting product. Um, yeah. And this talk is all about that local development journey, that one sort of facet of that journey. Um, the patterns learned along the way, and then don't worry, it, it is pretty, there is quite a bit to cover, but I'll, I'll recap it all at the end so you, you got it. And then there's also a blog post that's drafted. Um, just a really quick one about previous next. We got to work with some amazing clients. We celebrated our 15th year birthday party last night. Who went to the party last night? And you still made it today. Nice. <laughs> but yeah, we, as, as you know, amazing community. I get to work with some great people and amazing clients. So this is just the, the lovely, you know, like because my slides, had, my title had Nirvana in it, as soon as I, you know, posted that, I went, I know the theme. So maybe a theme change in sort of three, two, one. So so uh, who is this talk for? So, um, so I just want to kind of reiterate that this talk is all about the patterns for the environments, right? So it, there was a chat in, in Slack the other day just around core development and local development environments, and that chat went from you know, like this is the best tool for local development tool for core development. And then this is the best one for contrib. And then, and then it just really got me thinking, Hey, local development covers a lot, right? It covers a lot of workflows. It covers a lot of different, you know, use cases. And that's anything from core development to contrib development to just if you're doing project work on a very steady project, or even if you're an agency and you've got more than one project, like that, those are very different use cases. So I really do want to just cover that the best tool, like this is the caveat for the entire talk, the best tool is the one that fits your workflow. That's the key piece to take away from all of this. Because if you, if I come up here and I start spouting hey this is the best tool this is the best tool and then i just start to sound like this guy and if you do that in slack well then you probably sound like that guy too a little bit too right so the best tool is the one that works for you right that doesn't mean we can't have these conversations though and it's pretty it's a pretty diverse cast of local development environments that fit all these different different folks right everything from ddev all the way down to even like acquia desktop which you know, has its place as well. So I guess the question is, is this talk for developers? And so maybe. Is, is the talk for operations folks, infrastructure folks? Maybe. It's, it's, really, it's really for both. So the idea is that if you're a developer, maybe you'll get, like, take a few things home and gain a deeper understanding of local development environments. If you're from the ops side of things, maybe you'll come across and, and empathize with workflows and areas of improvement to help help out the development team. So right, right from the start, why do we need a local development environment? And the key is consistency for this. So I, when we when we started our journey, it was actually we'll get into our journey soon. But the idea of having these sort of you know disparate like you're using this tool, you're using this tool, like just doesn't really work in in modern development. Like we're getting new of like new versions of PHP all the time. Where our stacks are getting more expansive and bringing in Node and other services and 
like we have to really rein that in and have consistent environments across the board or at least accept that if you're not using consistent tooling that that's something you have to be very very cognizant about um i remember very early on like bugs around like file system issues right like we had our ci pipeline which was linux but then local development teams with you know just running it straight off osx and linux is case sensitive but osx isn't so their tests are passing locally but as soon as they commit and push the test started failing and it took a really long time to debug if there was a consistent environment in that case a lot of that would have just been squashed immediately but the other the other piece is around collaboration so the local development tool shouldn't just be like your local development piece of the puzzle and then the hosting's the other it really should be a place where you can collaborate on changes and prototype changes like even if that's things like redirects or you know or nginx or apache config or php config things like that it should be a place for you to pro quickly prototype and go hey i think this is a change worthy of going you know through the pipeline and, and out the other side so this brings us to our local development journey and it all started with handcrafted environments so in this case i'm talking about those osx environments php just manually installed through things like homebrew um, it was very like apache mod php mysql centric nobody really ran the same versions for everything i mean you could debate that if everybody was on the same osx and the same you'd be re reasonably close but even then configurations differ like you've got a different apache config you've got a different php configuration they were very handcrafted um, artisanally handcrafted local environments, right? Um, which then led to a lot of discrepancies between what everybody was running. And they took a lot to get up, up and running. And that is where we started our first little piece, which was Boxen. Does anybody know what Boxen is? Oh, yeah, you would know what Boxen is. What's Boxen? <laughs> Oh, it was Puppet, right? So, so yeah, sorry. Or some of my slides will have a little, like, you know, Master of Puppets reference or something, but, you know. But, yeah, it was Puppet. So in, Infrastructure as Code was taking off at that stage, and then there were projects geared towards local development, like configuring your OSX local environment in the exact same way. And we tried to go down that that path, but it just led to still a lot of while they may have been consistent by the end they were very very difficult to maintain and and understand while we're trying to solve this infrastructure problem and puppets really new and still maturing we're doing the exact same thing with our local environment so it became it became a lot and around that stage vagrant came on board which then meant okay well now we can kind of have a bit of a standard operating environment so to speak we can have a virtual machine, it could be Ubuntu. Okay, now we've all got a pretty decent base that we can build upon. And we actually applied our production manifests to those local development environments. So if somebody went vagrant up, pull those down and run it and, you know, they'd go off and have a coffee or two or, and, uh, you know, and it'd provision all that and, and get up and running. But that, timing that took a lot like that was a lot of time like like i alluded to so that's where things like docker came on board docker exploded right we we all know docker exploded well and and the idea was that instead of a big vm we had these smaller packaged linux containers and um they were much easier to like take we took away all that ability to package an image which we actually ended up doing with Vagrant. We packaged like full blown VM images that were like a gig and a half or something like that. And then we started shoehorning them into um, smaller, lightweight Docker images that developers could then pull down and run. But that was just a very small piece of the puzzle. Does anybody know what fig is? It's a, bit of, it's a slight deep cut, but um, oh, yeah. There we go. It's, it was 
brought out as fast, isolated development environments for Docker, so FIG. And, and you know, they took the naming scheming and it was or Orchid or Orchard was the company. And then they got acquired by Docker, which then became Docker Compose. And it's very, like, this was very early on and the Docker Compose configuration change and the CLI interface has not changed very you know, it was it was an innovation very early on that has been a massive impact to to what we do now, right? So, but with all this, like we were a few years in by this stage, and there was a lot of complexity involved in what we were doing. So, what we had to do was we had to keep it simple. So, um, and a part of this process, we went, okay, we're we're going to have Docker images, but we really have to take a step back and not just sort of apply the same wheel to what we're doing with Docker images. We have to go, okay, let's really lean into what Docker is and what Docker is trying to achieve and, and try and solve these issues of, you know, very expensive to spin up environments um, that were very complex and hard to configure. So the first thing we did was start to split up or consider splitting up all our components. So a Docker Compose stack comprised of these components from the beginning. So there was your web server, your database server, and then we would have mail and caching and search. So, and that could be any, any combination. We went through a few over, over time. We went from, yeah, memcache to Redis to, yeah, uh, solar to open search. And then that stack developed over time as well to the point now where, where this, is, this is what we run to this day. So we, we've moved to an Nginx FPM stack, which is very much the web at the top. And then we even took out our CLI. So when you run PHP inside an image, that's a completely separate CLI image. Same goes for Node as well. So if we're compiling our our style, like our front end components, that's, that's all done through the node component on a CLI. And then we still have our database and, and services in the back as well. And, and one mission around that keep it simple was to really lean into having a very beautiful Docker compose file as much as possible because there, there will always be some, so, some scope creep or, you know, or edge cases that need to come in for per project. So having a base that was simple was, was very much the goal. And simple doesn't mean easy either. Like this, it's, very, it's very easy to look at this and go, oh, cool, that's the Nginx, that's the FPM, that's the MySQL. But to get to this point was not easy and took quite a long time to get here with both the Docker ecosystem maturing but also our methodologies as well over time. So that was the web stack. We then have these infinitely running CLI containers, which folks, uh, developers can Docker exec into and then run their commands. And then finally, backend services as well. And I'll come back and, and talk to a few of these, these configurations as we go through. But it also goes, um, I just also want to point out that it wasn't just, even though I'm talking about environments, we also implemented a make file approach. So we took, instead of, I very much pushed Fing like, around and advocated for Fing internally at previous Next for a long time, but then it became very cumbersome in the way that you declare it with XML and write everything in PHP, which essentially boils down to a set of bash commands, which if you could just show those set of bash commands and tie them into a, a role or an, exec or an execution type, then it'd be much simpler for a developer to come onto a project and understand the commands that are executed to bootstrap the project. So that's why we went with make. and We moved on to make instead to complement our, our local development environment itself. I just wanted to kind of point this out because this is really us trying to keep it keep it simple in what we're doing. And here's a here's an example of what, what that looks like. It's it's very much cut down from what, what we have. And um, 
and now the images. So there's so if we were breaking down those Docker Compose components, we each image was a was a separate yeah repository. So these are all on Skipper now. They were previous Next, and they've slowly moved across. But we have image nginx, image PHP, in, uh, image MySQL, and all of those then support the multiple versions that, that we need. But um, one thing I really want to point out was that became very apparent was still the requirement of having to have local development configuration in certain cases because the images that we were running on production can run locally, but then developers require tools such as xdebug, you know, xhprof, um, ph, different PHP configurations. So what we ended up doing was starting with a, for PHP, we started with a base. Then we used Docker image tags to then build the FPM CLI image. And then we provided a build on top of that, which applied the local dev configuration, meaning that we had this very, um, very transparent declaration of this is what production images are. And these are the things that we've applied to our local development environment. Because up to this point, it was very difficult to understand, okay, what are we doing locally? What are we doing? And then what is actually being shipped to production? So, and I want to say there's very few things that are actually in those local dev images. Uh, for example, our Nginx dev image has, I think it's headers, the header size that gets passed out. Is, is expanded so then we can see all the cache tags when debugging's turned on, so things like that. And the entire flow is a Docker Compose up, an exec into PHP or Node, that service, and then running, running those commands. Now with the stage set there, we can move on into the learnings. And the biggest one that I made up for this talk in some ways or upon reflection and what where we ended up was really trying to understand our time to 200 met metric so time to 200 being I, i've cloned the repository i've upped the environment and i've run those extra steps now i'm returning a 200 on my environment i can get going and that can be in vagrant land a lot of time like i said a two coffee time potentially, or if it breaks, then you've got to start again, um, right down to potentially seconds or minutes. But when you multiply that by the amount of times you need to down the environment, up the environment, rebuild the environment, it really adds up. So like I said, Vagrant for us was, was minutes, potentially hours, depending on the client, like database size, that's another factor I'll, I'll touch on. But then Compose really did boil down to two seconds in a way, especially if things were cached. So through this journey, it was packaged as much as possible. So, so instead of having a lot of automation trigger when you have to up an environment, the more that you can front load and put into a pipeline and come out with an artifact at the end or a package at the end of it, the less development teams need to pay for that exponentially. You can do it once in CLI and then developers locally don't have to pay for that three or four times over. It was also ma uh, eliminating manual steps. So I, I alluded to databases, but it could be anything from installing dependencies to big, long, lengthy, like now you've got to install this package manually, you've got to add this API key, you've got to, you know, yeah, I don't know what, what your ritual might be when you Docker Compose up, but, uh, but if that's a manual step, well then maybe you can automate it. But, but that really eats into your time to 200 before you can get, get to work and, and start working on, on the site, so on, on an application. Also trimming ex, uh, excess data. Like excess data means more time to pull that data down or work with that data or even results in a ill-performing environment potentially. But in this case, 
trimming that data really slims down the environment and pays in dividends when it comes to spinning up an environment. Like, Another one to think about is image composition. So one thing around that stack that you might have noticed was that it was a container for each each service. So I'll get to that in a sec, but it was essentially one per language. So Nginx, PHP, FPM, PHP CLI. But what we we it took a while to get there and we had these rather bigger monolithic Docker images, which had everything in there. Uh, they, they literally had Apache, PHP, My, whoop, that can stay there, MySQL. <laughs> um, and what that meant was, okay, now it's time to go to PH, to the next version of PHP. Oh, I've got to adopt all the other changes that are in that image. And sometimes that's not desirable. You don't want to bring all that in, especially when you're starting to contrast like your node version and your PHP version. So we were in a position where if you bumped your version of PHP and it was all in this monolithic image, well, then you were also bringing in the latest version of node and then a different team or a different set of local developers would go, wait, 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 no, we can't, we can't do node 16 or node 18 or 20. That's, we haven't scoped that out yet. And so, but then the other team wants to bump PHP. So it becomes this, dependency hell all because it's all packaged in the one image so we went one one image per language but really it boils down to one image per service so and that's where the php fpm and the php cli came from as well uh, local hosts so this is this is something i've kind of advocated in a big way internally for a while, like for quite a while, and also um, externally. So this, this post was 2017, and this was the idea of everything being on localhost 127.0.0.1. We had development teams where they, if they were running commands externally, so outside of the environment, outside of the environment coming in, that might be the environment exposed on local hosts, port 8080, but then internally uh, it would be by a different name. So it was very hard to wire services together. So what we ended up doing was declaring everything under one network stack. And so if you were connecting to the database externally and internally inside the environment, you could connect via 127.0.0.1 which led to a very consistent, easy to understand approach and way less edge cases than what we were doing. And how we achieved this was that one network stack was there's a network mode flag in, in Docker Compose and we nominated a service. So in this case, it was Nginx. Um, we're potentially moving to maybe just like a network um, image that does very little and it's really just responsible for that but we nominated nginx as our network image essentially and everything joined that container and when you do this it's the exact same as installing php uh, so nginx php mysql on your local laptop and everything is talking on the one network stack by default, if you spin up Docker Compose, everything gets its own IP address, everything gets its own um, name internally, and that's that's very hard to grok. This simplifies that all down to localhost. That also meant that when it when it was time to move into the C, CI pipeline, localhost could be used there as well. So, and that smoothed out a lot of edge cases where we had like the CI settings.php file or the local like settings.php file because everything sort of communicated a little differently. By standardizing on local hosts, we removed a lot of complexity from our stack. And that's not to say, and this is one trade-off that we made. And, and the trade-off really was that it's one, one environment at a time. So, so if you spin up one stack, um, you can't, or one project, you can't spin up another. And, for the most part, it, it has paid off really well. It's the default. 
developers can pivot a little bit and expose their environment on a different port and then have multiple environments. But Docker Compose up and down is very quick, meaning it, it is quite nice to just, con you can just up and down and context switch around. Next one is uh, settings.php for your local development environments. So how many people have a settings.php file per environment? Yeah. Do you, do you like it? Do you run into issues? Uh, dev, staging, production, local, CI, like a switch statement that's, yeah, this one's for that environment, this one's for that one, this one's for, yeah, that's, we, we did that for a very long time. That was, that was the standard for quite a while. It was very much like if you went to our hosting provider back in the day, it, the first one was include this settings.php file and it was if you want a per environment configuration, here's an example switch statement and how to, how to manipulate that. But that led to a lot of complexity with our settings.php files. And for a long time, there was also a settings.local that wasn't checked in. And then a, de a developer might go, oh, that's not happening for me on my local, but it is for somebody else. And then you go through all the, you go through everything and then you go, oh, like, oh, there's this settings.php file that doesn't show up in Git because it's Git ignored but it's got all this extra configuration that overrides other things. So, and then they delete it and everybody's consistent again. So, so we moved towards a system where we removed that from what we were doing and we went with default with fallback. So the idea of having a default configuration, a default configuration, this is the skipper version, but it could quite easily be anything else, but a a um, default or, or an environment override and then a fallback so so for the dev environment it, it could be set on the platform or or the hosting provider is yep these are these are the configurations and then if that doesn't exist then fall back to the to the standard default which is the local configuration and that simplified things immensely because it'll still allowed per environment configuration and this has been enabled more as hosting providers have matured over time. They, they're now configurable. But this, yeah, really simplified our settings.php configuration. And, and there's still, still projects that I'll go through and trim that down and, and folks will go, oh, wow. <laughs> so that, I think that's a pretty great takeaway. And if you just want a really deep dive, shameless plug, I wrote a blog post. It took a really long time because I wrote about our config system under the hood and um, compared it to other hosting providers. But um, but it, it's a pretty deep dive into the mechanisms that we implemented on our hosting to make that happen. But the concept as it is stands stands. Quite. The next one's database images. So. Going back to before, I, we were we were spending minutes, maybe hours, syncing down databases, and what that meant was the developers going off and grabbing coffees, and you know, and waiting, and then but we really needed seconds, and and how we got there was through containerized databases. This blog post was two thousand eighteen. Um, we with we went down this router saying, hey, we're, we're running everything in containers, we're running our database server in containers, we're packaging everything, why don't we apply that same principle of packaging to our database images? And at first it felt like, ooh, like, is that the right fit? But the more we sat on it, the more we realized that import times really do chew up that time to 200. But not only that, it was very hard to control the distribution of data of databases across development teams because even to this day a lot of the standard is hey here's an ssh connection to to your dev staging production environment now go connect to that database and pull down pull it down 
Um, whereas we wanted to have us put that in pipeline, pull down the image once, package it, sanitize it, and then container images have a have our back surrounding them, which then means that we have a really nice mechanism to distribute as well. So not only are they they smaller, they're more secure and controlled, and um, and yeah, quicker. And over and over the years, we've slowly built out the MTK project, which is the MySQL Toolkit project, which does take you from a dumped data, a sanitized dump database to a to a database image. You could use this in your pipeline. Um, we leverage it on our hosting platform, but there's absolutely no reason you can't implement this in a CI pipeline yourself. And um, yeah, I did I did a talk about it. Okay. The next one, which is very recent for us, is around performance testing. So for local for your local development environments, how how many people do performance testing on their local environments? Yeah. Nice. Um this is a this is a tricky one because at this stage it's the there's a few routes that you could go. Something like a Blackfire has documentation. It takes a while to get up and running, but it's a great tool. And then you could ship something like a um, like an Xdebug or an XHprof or like an open source tool and configure it. But then it still lacks like that UI interface that something like even a paid product like Blackfire provides. And what we've been starting to use is a tool called SPX for our local development environments. And it's pre-packaged, has a web UI. While it sits a little bit less than Blackfire in usability, Blackfire is a, a product, it, this allowed us to say, hey, here's a pre-packaged performance testing tool that you can use right now, get running with, and, um, and start to understand and identify bottlenecks in your application. And that's the biggest takeaway from this is to have these kinds of tools available as defaults, meaning that when it's time to, when you're, when you're under fire and, and production's spiking and performance is going haywire, the last thing you want to do is go, okay, no, no, we'll set up Blackfire, we'll get it, get it going locally and we'll, you know, try to debug this. You really want to go, okay, cool. We've, we've got this tool. We'll start here. That gets us 80, 90% of the way there. Now we can understand, get a get an early understanding of bottlenecks or performance issues, and then then take it from there. So these are these are the things that really enable development teams, and those are the moments that really count in a big way. Um, that's just another blog post, but that links off to like this is all prepackaged in our images so everybody can go out and check out how we're configuring them how how we're using SPX but really the takeaway that I really want to instill is think about these kinds of scenarios and how these types of tools can be prepackaged and pre preloaded and ready to go for your development team the next one that we're starting to focus on is CI CD integration so Going back to those monolithic Docker images, CI CD platforms such as Circle and, and Travis and even GitHub Actions, they really do promote in a big way the golden image. Especially for us, we use Circle CI a lot. They promote the idea of this is your application image and it's got everything in there. Goes back goes back to because they're a VM based company it was spin up this machine execute a bunch of tasks and then exit and then that was applied to docker and where we're heading now is the idea of well why can't we just spin up ci and then run the exact same commands that any developer would would execute so that's that's something to something to consider because it's very self-documenting. Uh, if you can look at your CI file and go, okay, well, it checked out the code, it Docker composed up, it executed these three or four commands to get prepped, and then it started running the tests. A developer could quickly pick up the project, run the exact same thing, and, and get going. Okay. So 
all in all, to recap, um, I just want to throw a little little kind of spicy one there that might have been a little little undertone with this is to consider a, a tool such as Docker Compose in your flow. That's not, to, but again, the best tool is the one that you're using and facilitates what you're doing. But still consider the layers under the hood, and um, and that might even bubble up to to what you're using right now. It, it definitely helped us. Review your time to 200. So even just right now, or maybe not right now, I'm talking, but after this, you could just go out, check out your code, follow the steps to get up to a 200 and, and then stop the clock and then go, okay, that, you know, that took this, okay. And how many people do we have on the team and how many? And then that becomes a pretty quick, easy business case to go, okay, maybe we need to invest some time or maybe it's the other way. Maybe it's, no, we have a, we have a great system. Let's, We've, we've done, we're in a good spot. Consp uh, consider splitting out monolithic images, but even consider splitting out monolithic components where you might have that dependency hell in some ways. So if, if that's happening, that, that is a, a very nice win that you could implement because it'll keep coming up time and time again. Consider minimizing complexity on environments and, and lean on localhost where, where you can. Consider auditing your settings.php files and how that's used and then potentially how you could, how you can move across. I'm happy to talk to anybody about their settings.php files. It's, that's, it's fine by me. I somehow get, get a kick out of helping and, and cleaning all that stuff up. It's, yeah, it's pretty fun. Um, but also consider integrating database images and I'm here for the rest of the day and I'd love to talk to anybody about database images. Uh, yeah, I've doing it for quite a while now, but yeah, I'm really stoked to talk, talk about DB images because that has been such a massive, massive improvement to our, our environments. Um, in fact, uh, Carl implemented DB images with our platform through DDEV, so it, it's doable. It's doable for all. Cool. And, uh, and that's, that's my talk. <laughs> also, if people start talking about their local development tool or environment, we're, we're getting a boff going. I'm just, I'm just putting that out. <laughs> uh, Oh yeah, and it's uh, it's Lee's Lee's birthday. He's uh, in the back corner right there. I told him there was a slide. If we if we have time, we'll sing happy birthday. <laughs> cool, great talk. Um, what what is your average uh, sort of target to two hundred that you're getting at the moment? That's a good as an average across your your projects. Uh, that's a good question. Honestly, haven't particularly measured it because as soon as we went from the minutes, uh, sorry, the hours to minutes, and then the DB images, especially once we had like the prepackaged images and the DB images, uh, and and it was cached. The environments were coming up, like yeah, literally in second, as in like up. And then the next step was composer install, compile your compile your app, and then run the deployment steps. So so by the time we got to there, like through the process, we. Uh, yeah, we, we stopped thinking about how long does it take to spin up an environment. Yeah. Okay, I might rephrase the question. Okay. Yeah. What, <laughs> after how long you, would you then consider, okay, this is taking too long? Uh, sorry? Somebody say something? Oh, no. Okay. Uh, I mean, if, if you have to go off, make a coffee and come back, maybe? So minutes, uh, honestly, minutes, like in some ways, like if, I have to, if I have to be frank. But um, yeah, if you're, if you're spending, like we, we were very much in a position where it was like a half an hour exercise or, or even an hour. And that was very much due to the time that a, a vagrant up and then a puppet provision executed. And then the database took to actually import. And then if the database failed, then, so it was very apparent. So, um, so for us, if you're spending more than, you know, five, 10 minutes getting an environment up or not, not on the you know happy path 
all the way through, then then it's absolutely worth you know worth investing time. Yeah. Hi Nick, thank you so much. Uh, it was amazing. Um, everything you said about we've actually arrived at that conclusion as well separately. So everything you said yeah. uh, validates and works and works really well, yeah, cool. including database images and all that. That's actually really cool. And thank yeah. you for MTK. Oh, no. That's a uh, good stuff as well. Um, I have a question on make files. Yeah. So. Uh, make files essentially for making, you know, compiling things, and mm -hmm. it actually has inter internal yep. mm -hmm. some sort of way or mechanism to uh, know what has been compiled, what hasn't been not, because yeah. for C for mm -hmm. C C plus plus all that yep. stuff. So um, when teams are given mm -hmm. make files mm -hmm. created by someone and they want to extend it, they find the syntax a little bit challenging because it's not actual bash, right? It's not shell. Yeah. Um, have you considered switching to something like task file or Ahoy or any other wrappers um, um, just to wrap those commands that are long? We've we we haven't considered shifting. There ha there has definitely been a few times where you do get stung by like yeah, it's not exact bash, which then means that you know there's special syntax around execing out to you know get a get a variable and use it elsewhere. Um, and then there's definitely times where, like you said, um, how it's it does take into consideration the compiled artifact. So we have to mark everything. There's like a little one line. It's like phony star to say everything. Everything just run. Otherwise, you're in a position where your your commands will just skip over the top because they'll say, "Hey, it's already compiled." And it's like, "No, it hasn't. We're trying to we're trying to run this every time." Um, but once we did that, it, we were in a we we're in a great spot. Um, Moving moving from thing to make was was a big task, and then it opened up in a big way the ability for like we started with a very standard configuration, and that's morphed over time into in some ways for certain projects very bespoke configurations for what they're doing. So so far there hasn't been a big enough pain point to pivot, but I definitely recommend that other people do way up make or similar type things that execute bash and SQL like that, yeah, and Thank what you. they're benefiting, yeah. What were those tools again, just so people, uh, people ahoy, know? Ahoy and task, task file? Okay, oh, task file. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah nice. I might check. Yeah. Yeah, ahoy, ahoy's on gov CMS, just so everybody, yeah, yeah and, that, and that's where I've seen that too, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Do you, uh, yeah. Let's let's have a buff. Yeah. Do you want to have a buff? Let's have a buff. I'll, I'll go. I'll go write one down for this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> Sorry. Just a quick one over from here in the corner. Um, you mentioned not to talk about local development tools, but um, mm -hmm. over at Sydney Opera House, we've been using Lando really heavily. Yeah. No. And really been enjoying it. Yeah. Um, but that's a very high level tool. Yeah. Um, and you're talking about really going under the hood. Mm -hmm. Is there any advantage for a team that's really enjoyed the high level abstract stuff to going that next level deeper and creating our custom images and all that jazz? How long are you taking to spin up your environment? Is it nice It's very quick. quick. It's yeah. about five perfect. to ten. Yeah, yeah, perfect. There you go. Job done. Honestly that's right answer. it. Thanks. That's it, right? Cool. That's, that's the assessment. <laughs> that's the no. But um and and if you don't have much in the way of pain points then then Perfect. That's that's exactly why I put that slide there because you know that's working for you. Fast spin ups, small you know like small to no pain points. Perfect. You know what I mean. But if somebody's inclined to invest time into that, then I wouldn't say that's a waste of time. I think that's the caveat I'd add to. Like understanding these kinds of tools and technologies has definitely had a bit of a hidden benefit in in what we're doing, especially when things do break. So yeah. Thanks. It's a heckler. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to add, like, with with things like make files. I, mm. I mean, I personally don't think we're we're super attached to it. But if you look at most projects, make files, they're not super complicated. All they're really doing is calling 
one command and they might be abstracting out a bunch of parameters or options and things like that. So, um, I mean, it depends on what you're doing in your, you know, your Lando or your Ahoy. If it's like calling lots and lots of things, then, um, yeah, that might make sense to wrap it. But um, I'm not opposed to putting, using like package JSON for running scripts for front end dev tools or even in Composer putting scripts in there just to abstract out some of that stuff. It's just trying to make those these extra arguments or options just the same for a body and simplifying things. Mm. Great talk, Nick. <laughs> oh. Sorry, what was the question? Make, yeah. Um, yeah, so makes, yeah, make, makes included with default yeah with with linux machines so yeah so so it is a nice quick little prototyping tool if you've got like a init.sh in your project maybe the next step and you want and then you're creating you know the next shell script maybe a tool like make is is worth looking into maybe task task file or ahoy or or yeah package.json yeah yeah i hope we're done thanks everybody thank you. Thank you.